Thanks for the intro. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the I know the topic doesn't match what he told. That's nobody's fault but mine. Um, uh, but um, it is pretty much the same thing. I'm going to be talking about performance. Uh, welcome everyone. After lunch, I guess you're all full. I hope it doesn't bore you much. Uh, uh, so, uh, today I'm going to be speaking basically about um, my work uh, at Atlassian from the past uh, one year. We have been trying to set up all our teams to be uh, very sensitive to performance, front-end performance. Uh, and uh, my team was one of the first to adopt this. Uh, and so, that's what my talk is going to be about. Uh, how to get speed as a feature. Uh, in your front-end teams uh, and uh, basically what cadence do you have to follow uh, as a front-end developer. Uh, so the goal of this talk is uh, basically uh, what does it take to build a culture of uh, performance sensitivity in your front-end team. Uh, so you all know how important performance is and there's been multiple researchers, there's been multiple uh, talks on this, uh, I think like 2018, 2019, according to Google, their whole uh, focus is on performance. Uh, but for me, it was not the same. At least uh, my, my career graph, I did not care about performance for the first half of my career. And uh, only joining Flipkart, I was like, uh, Abhinav Rasogi told me like, no jank, there should be no jank in the website. And that's the extent of my knowledge until then. Uh, but in the past uh, one year at least, um, I have delved deep into what it takes like uh, to, to debug when performance issues come, what do you do, how do you monitor and what do you monitor for. Uh, so this talk will basically, I'll talk about uh, what all I learned during that time and what we've implemented. Uh, so first we, so all of you, do you all work on JavaScript? What do you, do you work on front end? What, what is the, like, what is the ratio? Most front end? JS. Uh, so, in JS at least, uh, according to this research, we all know performance is important. So, according to this research, uh, so this is uh, by Tammy Evert, so as part of uh, her company, her research company, they, uh, what they did was, uh, they slowed down uh, Tesco's website by 500 milliseconds. And uh, the interesting thing to watch out here was that uh, people thought that not only not only was it slow, but people thought other things about the website which were related to features that they were developing. They thought the features were childlike, they were complicated or hard to navigate. This is an important thing to keep in mind about why performance is important. And in Jira, we get similar feedback. Uh, I work on Jira like it. Uh, where users mistake slowness for a badly built website, badly featured website. So. You, your performance problem on your website might be bigger than what you know. It's users are just not complaining it's slow. They're just complaining that I can't, I can't go anywhere. I can't figure out this website because it's so slow. Uh, so to give you context, yeah, I work, I work on uh, uh, Atlassian's product uh, called uh, Jira. Uh, I work on the cloud uh, team, and uh, basically, when I joined, like I think six months before I joined, uh, we started a new repository. Uh, where we started developing Jira with uh, React. Uh, this has grown considerably in the one year and it's grown up to like 150 plus developers contributing to this repo. Uh, there's more than 100 commits every day. And uh, the teams are so dynamic, like we, we, I have moved teams already thrice in my, in my one, one year, one year, two months. And uh, so you might have to move within teams a lot. And we work both with like legacy pages, uh, the older pages that are served using JSPA and we try to incorporate them into the SPA that we're trying to build with React. So this is kind of the scale that I'm working with. Uh, so maybe my talk might not apply to all of you, but the principles should remain the same whether it's bigger scale or smaller scale. Uh, so one thing that I learned working, uh, working on this uh, product is that uh, Front-end performance is hard. It is so hard to uh, to convert something slow to to work faster. And worse than that, something I learned uh, is that front-end performance is fragile. Uh, so it takes a whole army to build a fast website, but it just takes one person's mistake to slow it down for a day. It is, yeah, and uh, if you don't have checks and balances in place, these things can slip unnoticed and gather into a big mountain which you cannot debug later. Uh, like if uh, even some ill-placed loop or uh, de not somebody not debouncing properly, all of this can affect a whole website. 
very badly so how do you go about how do you go about setting in these checks and balances that can help you uh, help your performance be more predictable as you make changes to your code base at such a rapid rapid uh, pace right like 100 plus commits every day morning i go to office and now i'm on leave i might maybe my team has changed there even so how do you how do you make sure what are the steps that you can take or at least what are the steps that we have taken to kind of build a performance culture within this large of a team uh so step 1 step 1 would be <laughs> to know your tools uh so knowing your tools uh, what what tools would you use to check performance mostly the ones provided by google i guess uh so one of the most more popular ones is uh, lighthouse so lighthouse is a tool that is integrated into your browser now what it lets you do is it uh you it you can run your website with lighthouse and it'll give you a certain set of recommendations and uh, insights into what might be wrong with your not even not only relating to performance but also related to accessibility and many other things but at least for our use case we found it to be very mild and we could not it was not very actionable for us so our premier tool at least is the chrome profiler uh so the chrome profiler is like the only only one of its kind comprehensive tool that will give us some insights into what code we are running when when a page runs uh so here basically i wanted to give a small demo of uh, so how many of you are familiar with the profiler and have used it okay, quite a lot of people but i still think maybe this might be useful and maybe it can be used as a point of discussion later on in my talk uh so i'll move to the demo now This is not going as I can. Okay. Oh, yeah so the chrome profiler is basically the chrome profiler is basically one of the tabs in that uh, chrome provides as part of its developer tools uh, so you have your uh, it shows your html elements there is a source code it shows console and so on there is a performance tab so the on um, So in this performance tab what this allows you to do is uh, two kinds of recordings uh, and i use both, both of them extensively so uh, one of them i use when i want to make interactions with my website and uh, see what kind of uh, js stack i uh, js flame charts i get within that or this one i use to reload the page and see page load performance so let's reload the okay wait. so let me let me this outside let me just So this is me reloading the Google Chrome website, uh, the Google website. Uh, so as you saw, it basically knows when the page load has finished and stops profiling immediately. <coughs> so if you want to have a look at what this uh, says right now. uh here at first in this tab uh, you it gives what exact what, all the javascript that it ran you can basically drag around and select whichever is interesting to you like i suppose this might be the most interesting part for us uh but even more helpful i feel at least is the screenshots that it pro provides on every frame here uh, so you see that there was no activity until here and then there was a load and then you get the date then it comes back here right so this page basically took from here to here to here to load something and this i feel is very uh, yeah is like the highlight of 
Chrome profiler for me. I'm always looking at places where all my all the stuff that I am interested in loads, and I select that much part of it. So once you make this selection, all of the part of, uh, below it kind of molds into that uh, selected part of it, and you get more interesting data. Uh, one of the we, I have used basically this network tab, the flame charts and the call tree here. Like all the performance debugging that has been useful to me and I have been able to get some outcome out of it is by using these three tabs at least. So uh, the network tab is quite interesting in the sense it shows you at the exact, po the exact point of time that your <coughs> scripts would have loaded. Like for Google uh, at this point, you can see that the logo started loading here and then you can investigate what happened before this if this is too slow for you. Uh, once, but I think still the most highlight, highlighted feature of Chrome Profiler is its flame chart. This has helped me numerous times. Uh, I, I might be able to show you an example too. So what the Chrome Profiler shows is what, what JavaScript it exactly ran, right? So this can correspond to the JavaScript that you have on your uh, uh, for in your code base uh, and if you are running unminified stuff, it's very easy to correspond what's happening where and the longer this flame chart is, the, the slower your uh, call, call is, right? There is something here that is holding up. So the flame chart, the way it works is for every call that this, so this is a JavaScript call and for every function that it calls, you have a step in the flame chart and a deep flame chart means that the call tree was very long. So when I see a deep flame chart, I basically try to go to the call tree and I try to find the most. So the call tree here shows you how much time it took and what percentage of the original call it was. And I, I many a time I have found that uh, I have been able to find expensive calls using this and uh, been able to debug my performance uh, problems. Uh, other than this, uh, one other thing that I find useful is these markers that the profiler provides. Uh, so these are by default here, like it says it, the frame started loading and uh, the DOM content loaded at this point. Uh, even though Chrome does provide this, it's not usually very useful for uh, my website at least. Uh, so we try to put as many customized markers as possible. Uh, we use this. Um, we use this API, it's not really standard, but we use this API to record in our uh, timestamp, uh, record the timestamp of each marker, performance marker that I used and uh, this shows up uh, in, sorry, this shows up in this graph as a, as a marker and that's kind of useful for me as to like, so, so I can correspond a UI event to what code exactly ran over there, like something that's happening on my screen to what code actually ran which is what I find is very challenging with the Chrome profiler as is. But it's still the best option we have and uh, I use it extensively to debug. Um, so moving on, uh, now that we have established that it has uh, uh, a DOM content loaded and markers such as this, uh, we can see how we do measuring and stuff like that, how we can do measuring. So. Uh, Another, uh, yeah, this is one of the places where, where I was able to find a performance issue. Uh, so for example, we added an asynchronous, uh, we, we code splitted our code and added some asynchrony to it, which kind of pushed, the, pushed whatever I wanted to load over there to here by lowering this, because Webpack 3 automatically lowers priority. And so I had this bunch of stuff happening before my most important, uh, important JavaScript was loaded. That was the thing I was able to fix looking at this uh, graph. This was in the network tab of uh, my Jira. And uh, this was another place where uh, React was continuously re-rendering something that we were doing something wrong. This existence of large number of uh, flame charts was a clear indicator. We were able to reduce this to one, which was a huge win for us. Um, so that's step one, know your tools, know how to operate them. Not only you, everybody in your team, whoever touches the code in your website should know how to use Chrome Profiler if you are serious about performance. So measure your website. Step two, uh, what do you measure when you have uh, a website that you... So typical website works like this. So there is some loading state when there is, uh, when the page is being loaded and then there is some visual content appears, right? There's HTML and CSS that's painted. 
So if the loading, uh, if you are doing server side rendering with your thing, you can actually eliminate the whole loading state and only show the, and then you will know the difference between having the first meaningful paint and uh, some time to interactive. Uh, so this I would consider as the first meaningful paint. Maybe it's different for you. Maybe you don't need the tree there, or maybe you don't need the sun. Maybe you just need the mountain. Uh, Next step, you will download and parse the JS and then your site becomes interactive and that for us is the time to interactive. So these are the two most important metrics that we gather for all of our pages, at least for page load metrics. Uh, we also try to find uh, timestamps of how much each interaction took, how much an Ajax call, uh, how much time an Ajax call took and so on. But this is pretty much standard for us. So other things that we like to measure, we measure bundle size, we measure DOM size, we measure how much time an API takes, we measure SPA transition timings and so on. Uh, you would have to, so I still believe that custom metrics is still the way to go when you want to measure the performance of your website because you are still the owner of how your website works and how and what metrics are important to you in your page. So we use these API to record performance uh, uh, metrics. Uh, so we're, window.performance.now basically uh, gives a timestamp over there of what happened at that point of time and you can assign a mark to it using the second API. You can collect all the marks that you uh, that you created and what we do is basically send this to a backend service and then use that and query that to uh, do our monitoring. So uh, this is all fine. Page by page you have your time to interactive metrics, you have your uh, meaningful paint metrics and all of these. But how do you make sense of it at an at a team or org level? Uh, so we calculate something uh, called a speed index for us. Uh, we call it by something else, but it's equivalent to a speed index. Uh, so in the speed index, uh, basically the, what factors inside it is that uh, for every page, there's a pair, we calculate a page index, so which is basically uh, so time to interactive is in terms of seconds or milliseconds, right? So we try to convert that and uh, convert that into a whole number that people can understand. And using that page index, we try to prioritize the pages that are most important to us in the application and we give it different weights and then we com come at a speed index that is relevant to, this, to us. This has worked pretty much well for us and when we set goals and stuff, we set it based on the speed index. Step 3, monitoring and alerting. So this is like really, really important if you are going to, uh, if, you are, if you want to know what's happening in your user's website. So what do you measure, what do you monitor? You can monitor absolute numbers, time to interactive, like just see every day what's the time to interactive. Uh, you can measure trends across time, like what was, yes, what was it yesterday, what was it on this, when this build got released and so on, we do that, uh, so that we get to know which build actually caused a regression. Uh, you can have stacked charts uh, of uh, divided. So if you have one time to interactive, you can say how much network time it took and how much uh, actual, uh, how much, what was the, you can basically uh, divide it into different stacks and um, maybe that's useful to you. Basically, whatever you want to monitor, uh, you are the owner of your website after all. And I have found that different things are important in different pages for us. For example, uh, we have this uh, uh, we have this distribution of our uh, ready for user, as we call it, uh, across different percentile. And uh, there is so we by this graph we basically found that there is a small spike here, which meant that around the 40th percentile people were ex experiencing um, some slow slowness over there, and uh, we were able to actually correct that and push that down to make that graph more uniform, and that helped us. Uh, we had this, uh, so we created the stack chart across percentiles, uh, so uh, each thing is like, so the first one is the page loading, then how much time the skeleton took and how much time the view rendered with and so on. So uh, one of our, uh, one of our optimizations reduced uh, a lot of time in the, in the 90th percentile here. Uh, so I keep telling percentile, percentile, right? So what is percentile? Percentile is basically if you calculate uh, for your real users, if you are calculating uh, the time to interactive, if you order them in increasing order and you pick the 90th percent uh, user uh, at that point, whichever user, whatever time to interactive that user had, uh, then that's how you would look at percentile data. So you can you can have good, you know, basically all your uh, fastest pages will be in the lowest percentile and the slowest pages will be in the highest percentile. 
Uh, so for us, this is really helpful as we want to help our slowest users and uh, that generally results in the help of all of our users. Averages are not very meaningful for us because it doesn't really translate to what the user is seeing. Another point of contention while monitoring is uh, to do synthetic or real user monitoring or RUM as they call it. Uh, so synthetic for us, so a, a story here is uh, we rewrote a, a component uh, completely which kind of changed our page architecture and the whole time we did synthetic testing. Like we had the staging in instance and we thought it had uh, user specific data and uh, we did uh, throughout the development cycle we did testing with that and but when we released to the real users we observed different regressions. So for us with our variety of data and our variety of different configurations that is possible for us synthetic does not, only synthetic does not really work out but synthetic is what we have in control. Uh, so we use real user monitoring heavily. Um, we have our, uh, we use a tool called Splunk which basically allows us to do SQL queries on all our data and uh, make the beautiful charts that I showed you earlier. Um, yeah, so that's, other than this for alerting, alerting has been really hard for us. Uh, like to establish a baseline at different percentiles and see whether it improved, increased or not to get, get an alert. We do have alerting in place but usually we are all very fatigued to look at it because it alerts at wrong times and things like that and that's something we are working to like get, get it right within our team at least. So that's monitoring and alerting. Step four is how you will integrate all of this into your SDLC, software development life cycle. Uh, how do you make sure that your SDLC is set up to, to work with well, good performance, right? Uh, but there are some prerequisites for this, uh, at least for me, without these pre prerequisites, our software development lifecycle wouldn't be set up for performance at all. So we have these robust practices in place. Basically, whenever you find a performance issue, you need to change large parts of your code base. It's not like fixing a bug for us, at least. Uh, and it's been the case wherever I've worked. Performance usually requires a rethink in architecture and that means your code has to be changeable. Like it, it should be easy to refactor your code and that is possible if you have a good integration test bed. Uh, unit tests will go to uh, the dogs whenever you try to refactor everything and integration test is your best bet. Cypress is our tool and uh, that's what we use extensively. We do continuous deployment uh, to staging and uh, staging dog fooding and production. So as long as master is green uh, because our test bed are good, we trust it and just push it to production. So, but I think the winner in our process at least is feature flagged rollouts. We use a service called Launch Darkly, Launch Darkly and that allows us to roll out each and every feature percentage wise to our users. Uh, so, uh, which is a huge win. Like we just have to turn off the feature flag to if we see any regressions, be it performance or be it just bugs. So with all this in place, in our SDLC, how do we incorporate performance all the time? So I think heavily uh, you will have to look at uh, performance while you're planning. Uh, you, so we, we are trying to drag Jira into becoming an SPA and, uh, and that means a lot of performance testing. Usually all of our pages are loaded, uh, refreshed uh, newly every time and uh, that's been, uh, and that's been op micro optimized to try and make it better and push pulling that into an SPA requires extra thinking for us uh, in the performance direction. We do server side rendering that means writing universal code, things has to work in the browser and the uh, and the server. Uh, so this means we are switching up state management libraries, we are switching up uh, how much of the tree we are walking, to how, what all calls we are making and basically we are trying to find the, uh, the critical path of what needs to be shown to the user. Uh, and that is, uh, that is excluding from feature development, right? These are things that we are doing only so that performance is better. We do goal setting for performance. So even if it's not like, even for every feature, if you're not like I'll improve the performance, we at least have a goal saying that you will not regress the performance. Uh, and we discuss perf budgets with the designer. This is the hardest part. So the designer wants a feature, right? And you, uh, you have to come up with the, with the, with the decision of whether it is really critical, whether this feature needs to be at the beginning for the user and how much it will impact performance. You need to make these, at least have these thoughts in, in the planning phase. 
during the development phase. During development, uh, we have a cadence of performing QA demo at the end of every PR uh, and uh, QA demos criteria of done uh, will have profiling in it. So in the criteria of done, we will open the Chrome profiler, I will sit with another developer, we will open the Chrome profiler and we will look for anomalies, we will make ba various interactions, we will record profile and see if something, something we can catch. And uh, that has helped us, like things like the uh, re-rendering, continuous re-rendering that I showed you, those things have been caught in QA demos themselves. Uh, we do, like I said, we do use synthetic monitoring. So throughout the thing, we are releasing to staging and uh, running tests on that and seeing uh, all our uh, uh, time to interactives. At least we aim that it should not increase. Uh, we add new measurements, new features, new measurements, and uh, and we keep updating our speed index as per whatever new features we have released. Pre-release. So this is a stage we go through uh, because we have launched Darkly. So what we do basically is we release we release our feature to 1% of our users and uh, which is quite huge and uh, we try to do real user monitoring with them and we try to find any uh, uh, anomalies during that time and uh, this this is basically where we spend a large amount of time like we find something here and go back into development uh, and that's why i i say that real user monitoring is the winner here uh, so once we are sure that we are not performing, we are not having any regressions and things like that, we move to the release stage. And during the release stage, basically there is a company-wide um, uh, everyday meeting that happens uh, where whatever is being released gets discussed in that meeting and we have to show more RAM monitoring in that. Uh, so we have to show what monitors are in place, what are the handlers are in place and so on before releasing the feature. Uh, and we have alerts for all possible, uh, for possible edge cases because even though we did synthetic and real user monitoring, there are still people in the 99th percentile who will be like, I'm, I'm on this page for 100 seconds or so on. And most importantly, we gather user feedback. Uh, we have found that our speed index, when it fluctuates, our user feedback fluctuates similarly. So that has been the uh, motivator for all our performance work till now. And uh, this is really important for any new features we ask the user. And sometimes it's a fatigued response, but still we have gathered a lot of stuff that is useful for us. We read all user feedback. And then we iterate, iterate, and iterate. We, uh, at the end of the thing, we have a retro. We see what went right, what went wrong. If something went wrong, we add new steps to our, uh, our process. Or we, re we even remove steps sometimes. But most importantly, I feel we celebrate all the wins that we make with our performance. There is always, we always pop that champagne. We, there is a, uh, an update that goes through company-wide, team-wide, org-wide that celebrates all the wins that we make with our performance. I think that's an important step in the cycle uh, that people feel that uh, because performance work, when you do performance work, there is a large amount of work for very less uh, return of investment. Uh, but that is still the way to go in the end. Uh, you, you cannot have bigger changes without all the toil behind the performance uh, profiling. So to recap, uh, how do you introduce performance culture into your team? You know your tools, you measure everything. But you monitor a few things, you set up monitoring, you have alerts around these things, uh, you have goals that these monitoring uh, reaches, you integrate with your software development lifecycle. Without this, you do not have a performance culture. And generally, you celebrate when you are able to improve your page, right? Yep. Okay. Oh. Yeah, that's my talk basically. Uh, any, yeah. 30 minutes correctly. Uh, so that's my talk basically and I hope it helps you uh, do, do work on performance and make faster websites. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't give you much info on mobile because it's mostly, uh, we mostly work for uh, the browser. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for listening.